on days. I did not get any information on anybody doing night. So there you go. This is a tough block. I highly encourage you guys to be studying at least, you know, half an hour to 40 minutes, 45 minutes every day, not just pick and choose and then trying to cram. There is a wealth of information on there. Again, I'm on Discord. Just go ahead and at any time, I'm I'm there probably from about six ish to approximately eight o'clock. I do play uh, games after the six o'clock time frame, so it may take me a little bit longer to answer you during that time frame. I'm also available during the weekend because I'm constantly on the computer, not like I am. During the weekdays, it may be a couple hours before I see it. So the computer is up and running. I'm just doing work around the house at that point. So if you got a question, please leave it. I'll answer it. Make sure that you leave the at mayor, M A Y E R sign. And that way I know I'm going to get it. I can see it pop up in my nice little handy dandy uh, 338. Q, so to speak. So today we're going to go through most of our objectives. Hopefully we'll be at 3 Bravo before we break to lunch. And then we'll do the TO after, or after lunch as well as part of 4 Charlie. So depending on where I'm at before lunch, that's where we'll stop and we'll continue it. Tomorrow morning is signal flow. That's where I like to be. And in the afternoon, we need to do our homework. We'll make sure that you're doing your homework. I'm not sure if anybody's seen the nice little handy dandy picture that I put up in chat. You're going to run across things like this when you're out in the field. I'm not saying you're going to run across rattlesnakes or anything like that. I've run across scorpions tarantulas uh i have run across snakes but they weren't poisonous but i think the worst one i ever had was sticking my hand into a nest of black widows and not knowing it that was out at mcclellan air force base probably about two o'clock in the morning and the lights in that place were very low when I stuck my hand in the back of a panel, something didn't feel right, pulled it out, went and got the safety life off the, the safety board, went back, took a look at it, and there was approximately four to five huge black widows in there. And then I started looking through the rest of the place and went, no, I'm not, get, I'm not working on this radio. We'll wait until tomorrow to get that place cleaned up. So it just goes to show you that we do have problems that is out of your control. So it's up to you that when you see dangerous situ situations like that that's out of your control, just back up, walk away, go tell someone. Of course, you're going to have a crowd afterwards. So with that snake that was in the, I call it a phone panel, could be internet, anything like that. But that was one of those, you just open it up and hope that that thing just leaves. If it doesn't leave, you're going to have to find somebody to go get it out of there. Kind of looks like an arm, sir. Kind of like what we had at our telecom. Okay. Uh, uh, we used to have a similar problem with squirrels and pedestrians, or not pedestrians, tourists. Every summer when we got lots of tourists in the area I lived in, uh, Probably about once a month, somebody would hit our, one of our pedestals with a car <laughs> and knock it over. and uh, Or we would go out to an ORM cabinet, which is like that, where it's just full of cards that dis distribute signals um, and handle uh, higher level routing. Uh, there was once or twice, I remember, in my three years there where I'd get a call from one of the technicians out there and they'd ask me to like do something with the equipment because they found it because it was overheating. We were getting overheating alarms because it would be filled to the brim with uh, like walnuts and various nuts that squirrels had been, had been storing for the winter. 
to the point where it had no airflow. Oh my goodness. That sounds like down here we have the squirrels. If they're hungry, they'll chew through the cables down here. That's because they're uh, uh, soy-based now. Modern cables have soy-based plastics. And so was, they say they don't, but for some reason, animals still like them. We had the same thing with our fiber optic cables that run underneath housing. Rats love them. We had to switch distributors that use older plastics. Huh. Interesting. All right. So we've uh, eventually got everybody ready and talking about our stories here and life lessons. So let's get on to the objective for today. Actually, a few of them. We're going to look at identify basic facts about principles, capabilities, limitations of satellite transmit and receive systems. And we always provide an AFSC application. You're going to see this in block nine with the, oh man, I think it's called the GMT terminal, TSC 160. I'd have to go back and look. You will also touch upon the SATCOM in Block 8, which is the Prick 117 Golf. So you're going to be having to deal with SATCOM probably throughout the rest of your career or a portion of it. We're going to look at the basic radio picture, radio funda fundamental radio parameters, radio performance assessment, and auxiliary functions. Now, I'm not sure if this particular sheet has been given out to you. You can fill it out. There is, on this slideshow, a completely filled out version of it. So if you're just trying to get yourself familiar with it, go ahead, fill it out. And then, you know, later on when you're trying to figure out if it's correct or not, just come back to this video and... We do have the version of this where it is filled out and you can check your work. Or you can send it to me and I can go through it and help you out. Well, we always start with transmit when dealing with radios. We look at the transmit path first and then the receive path just to give you an idea how things work with each other. Normally, when we look at radios, we always look at the transmit path first because some of those devices are used in receive if it's a transceiver. So that's the reason why we always use transmit first. Because it's, you know, it's the long version, but when you get to receive, it's like, oh, we use this, we use this, and we use this in it. So with our transmit path, we are generally looking at a microwave slash satellite scenario. With this one, we call transmit baseband to the distant end. The easiest way to explain baseband is the aggregate signal that the multiplexer is going to produce that's going to be modulated on the radio. We're going to accomplish this in three steps, modulation, upconversion, and amplification. So let's take a look at each one of them. First of all, modulator is going to modulate it. you got a digital signal, which is the aggregate that's going to be combined with a frequency. Normally we call that the intermediate frequency. And I have a problem with the 70 megahertz, not with the 70 megahertz, but the 700 megahertz, because when we're dealing with a tisser, you're going to see that our IF function will be in the 7.2 to 7.625 gigahertz. So depending on your radio system, the transmit IF is going to be probably a lot different than your receive IF. Now our, our 70 megahertz is actually an IF signal. So when we look at the next part, so we've modulated into a IF. We go from IF to RF. This IF is going to need what's called a local oscillator to be combined with it to get to the RF. And then, of course, because we've manipulated the signal and we've done some other things to it, like filter it and uh, combine it with other things, 
You're going to need some amplification on there, especially in transmit. The idea is I needed to get it to the distant end. Hence, transmit baseband to the distant end. So I got to take that aggregate signal and send it out the airways to the distant end. Our next part is called recover the baseband. This is accomplished in three steps. This is the receive path. It's going to get that signal, and because it's coming from the distant end, there's this thing called path loss. You guys have heard about it in block four. You're going to recover that signal and amplify it. You're going to down convert it from the RF to IF, and then from IF, you're going to demodulate it. We're going to run it through a low noise amplifier. Now, if you've had Dish Network or DirecTV, there you go. You're going to hear something called an LNA. It is very sensitive as far as picking up the signals. And the idea behind it is it's going to run it through a filter, and then we're going to amplify it. We got a down converter. This down converter is going to take the RF to IF. Again, it's going to use the local oscillator to combine with that RS signal to get the IF out. We're going to look at a demodulator to get the IF down to baseband, demodulating it. With AGC, this is a receive term. I have never seen anything different in the radio world as far as AGC. Now, for transmit, we have a lot of different acronyms like transmit gain control. We have automatic power control, and there's a few others out there. I probably will miss. So, just, just to give you an idea. Now you remember that I told you that the sheet that was empty, well, here it is filled up. So as you can see, we have a multiplexer that's going into our first stage, which is the modulator. So we're going to take the baseband, the IF, we're going to run it to an up converter, which is going to take that IF and convert it into an RF, and then the HPA, high powered amp, is going to amplify it and send it out the antenna. Now when we receive the signal, it's going to go through a low noise amplifier, so it's a very weak signal. we got to boost it up. So we amplify it, send it to the down converter, so we're going to convert RF to IF, and then the demodulator is going to take that IF and convert it into, or clean it up and send it out as an aggregate signal to the demultiplexer, or multiplexer. We also give you an idea of what's happening with the up converter and down converter. If you take a look at the little sine wave in the circle, those are your local oscillators. We need those in order to up convert from IF to RF or down convert, which is RF to IF. So that's the reason why we like to show this picture is to give you an idea of where that local oscillator is. We have something called a branch assembly. The branch assembly is passive. What do I mean by passive? There is no electronics power, so to speak, in it. So the electronics is not driven by anything other than the signal. And it has particular purposes for it. If you look at the arrow in the circle, that's an isolator. You see that we have a duplexer, which is the crossed arrows. And next one after that is what we call a filter. And then the next one after that is called a circulator. And then if you look on the receive line, you'll see the box with two uh, diagonal lines or horizontal, three horizontal lines and two diagonal lines going through it. Now, again, that's a filter. So with that in mind, that's what a branch assembly looks like on a basic level. And I'll show you in the signal flow diagram where that branch assembly is and to walk you through it. So we have what the branch assembly does, directs microwave energy to and from the antenna guide, suppresses unwanted harmonics, internal noise, yes, aids in receiver selectivity, that's very true. And then of course permits monitoring of the output power. Let's go through each one of these. 
with the circle with the arrow, wherever that arrow is pointing, that's where the signal is going to go through. However, nothing should be getting back through it. It is one way and one way only. The idea here is I need to keep things separate with that isolator. For example, if it's in transmit, the RF power goes out through the arrow, but I don't get what's called voltage standing wave ratio, which is the return waves coming back. Now, if you've ever played with a slinky, best way I can explain that is extend the slinky out, one person hold it, the other is going to what we call a wrist action, and flip it to where it has a wave that goes all the way to the end to the other person. Well, what happens is, is if that person is holding it steady, that wave is going to hit his hand and then bounce back. That is a return wave. That's not good. So it defeats the actual forward going waves versus the, the backwards wave is going to help negate it. And that's the last thing you want. If the wave was to get back into the equipment, and that's where the isolator comes into play. If it didn't have the isolator, we would probably burn up what's called the FET, field effect transistor, which is our amplifier. We have a directional or dual couplers. These are, and you guys have actually played with one. It's called the through line watt meter in block one, where it shows you forward reflected power and Piggybacking off of what I said, you have two elements. Those are RF diodes. One diode is taking a look at the forward power. The other diode is looking at the reflected. Now, when you select forward power, hopefully you got either the 2 watts or 10 watts out. This is for the PRIC-113, and you shouldn't have got anything back. Normally, with a dummy load, you don't get anything back. But... If you didn't have a tight enough cable on them, yeah, you're going to see some reflected power. We have duplexers, just giving you an idea of what one looks like. This is a bi-directional coupler, so to speak. It means that when you are inside this little device, and I'm pointing to the Delta Uniform 500 VHF UHF indoor duplexer. The idea behind it is either to combine or separate the signal so it'll go on one line. You're going to see this in the Tisser, which is a tropospheric satellite support radio, better known as the AN slash GRC 239. That's what we're working to get to. And of course, you can see the CAN filters there. I've come across those before where we had two radios on one. That was to keep certain frequencies from interfering with it. This is a more simplistic one. This one I've used when I had DirecTV. This is to combine your over-the-air with your satellite cable. And you bring it inside on that one cable, then you take another one and separate it out. One goes to the back of the TV for over-the-air. The other one goes to your SATCOM box, then back to your. We look at filters. Filter is a filter. Idea behind it is I want to be selective about what I need to let through and block everything else. Circulators. Now, this one is when you look this up on Google, you just got to scratch your head because when you read it, it's just like, what? is it doing but it's a passive device for some reason they're able to use the combination of ferrite which is iron core and how it works with one frequency and not with another so I'm still playing around and trying to get a good feel for how that thing works all I can tell you is is Sometimes you just got to go with the flow and go with what the engineer says. I don't like punching the I believe button, but hey, in this case, I'm out to hang on this one. 
So you can see the circulator can either be a three or four port. In our case, it's going to be a three port. It's going to differentiate between what's a receive frequency and what is a transmit frequency. And if I understand the way that engineers have designed this, is because of the difference of frequencies, it knows where to go. It has to do with the impedance of that device. We have something called Rago, not ragu like the spaghetti sauce, but Rago. Let me explain what those what the acronym stands for. R is for RSL. That's receive signal level. A is for AGC in voltage. It's automatic gain control in voltage. G is for gain. And O is for output. Kind of reminds me of Sesame Street. So with Rego, we've got two boxes here. If the receive signal is going up, my AGC voltage is going to reflect or follow what the receive signal is doing. In other words, it's going to go up. Our gain is going to go down and the output is going to stay the same. And then it goes vice versa in the reverse. In other words, my receive signal is low, the AGC is low, my gain is going to increase, my output is the same. So the easiest way to explain what's happening here is I like to come up with the analogy of an airplane talking to the air traffic control tower. If the plane is 200 miles out and calls you in the tower and you did not have this AGC, it would be extremely weak. And you would literally have to turn that volume control up max probably just to hear that plane talk to you as the plane gets closer the receive signal level starts going up well because you don't have agc you're going to have to start turning that volume down now when it finally gets there it's probably going to be really loud so you're going to have to turn that volume down a lot so when the plane takes off the receive signal is pretty strong, but as it keeps going out further, it starts getting weaker and weaker, so you've got to turn that volume back up into a comfortable listening level. Well, that's the human way of being AGC. So we put AGC in and make these electronics work for us, so we just turn the volume to a comfortable listening level which is where that output wants to be, a constant output, whether the receive signal is high or the receive signal is low. So that's what the whole purpose of this AGC is for. You can see that RSL and AGC are directly proportional, and then RSL and gain is indirectly proportional. Whole idea behind the automatic gain control, keep your output constant, that way you don't have to vary anything. We're going to look at basic radio parameters. We got frequency, accuracy, stability, uh, bandwidth, frequency response, selectivity, gain, and sensitivity. The first two that are up is frequency, accuracy, and stability. This one depends on your oscillator. If you got a crappy oscillator, you're going to have frequency uh, uh, crappy frequency, accuracy, and stability. In other words, it's going to drift all over the place. And that's the last thing you want a radio to do is drift to the point where it's in a, it's onto someone else's channel. That's a bad thing. You have bandwidth. Now again, this is one of those things that you can choose your poison on. This one says the difference between upper and lower frequencies. The other one we talked about speed and that. How big is your bandwidth on there as you're sending it down the aggregate or sending the aggregate send, aggregate signal down the path there? We have frequency response. This is the frequency range of where an audio device or system will produce or reproduce. Now, 
most of the time when I look at this, I always think of, well, gee, how many stereo systems have hi had versus, you know, car radios and so forth. And I always pull open the manual and look for the specifications, and it tells me frequency response. Most of those numbers are 0 0.00%, you know, 1, 5, 10, whatever. And that what is that is telling you is the audio that you're, let's just say it's a radio, the audio that's being sent out and when you demodulate everything and you can hear it is extremely close to what the original was. With selectivity, this is where you can be very you know, broad or What's the opposite word of broad? Uh, selective. For example, there are two types of things when looking at receive when we talk selectivity. You have pre selection and then you have overall selectivity. Anytime you deal with a receive section that has a filter in the front, that's normally pre selection. In other words, I'm narrowing that bandwidth down to a certain area. When I get it inside, and this is where that your IF comes into play, that is very selective because I want to be right on that frequency. I don't want to have anybody else on that frequency. And it has to do with what's called heterodyning. We look at gain. I like to associate that with your volume control knob or selector switch. Sensitivity, this is how well you're able to pull that signal out of the dirt and be able to understand what that person is saying. Next up is called a systems approach. Oh my goodness, how many times that uh, I've had to troubleshoot other people's equipment just so that I could call out the appropriate person for it. When we look at systems approach, it's not all about your equipment and that's it. You got to figure out where the problem is and it may not be your problem. Let me try to explain this. If you had, in our case, we're going to be looking at the Tisser. Tisser comes into a two item package to where you have transmit and receive. Well, who attaches to your equipment? Well, first, you've got to have a multiplexer, and second is you're probably going to have a whole bunch of users. That's on one end. Now, duplicated on the other end. If someone's complaining that they're not getting their signal, well, normally you're going to go to your equipment first and verify that your equipment is working, and then you're going to work your way back. In our case, we, it would probably be the multiplexer or it could be that individual. Now, how you do that troubleshooting is up to you. Normally, I would check my equipment out. Then I would go, okay, who you know, are we looking at one user or are we looking at multiple users? That's a good way to find out if it's a multiplexer or if it's an individual piece of equipment. And from there, you can either talk to someone else about getting out there to do it. And it's also an opportunity for you to look and see how the equipment works even further. So that way you get a nice warm fuzzy and you're learning something different to get that whole systems approach down. Believe me, I've done a lot of that to where it wasn't my equipment. I ended up fixing it. So just so we could get the job closed. We're going to look at radio performance assessment. This is quality, reliability, and speed for performance measurements. We look at quality. This is how closely the output resembles the input. You get reliability. This is a percentage of the time that the system is available. And speed, how quickly it can process it or how quickly you can get that equipment up and operational or switched over. That's where switching comes into play, auxiliary channel performance monitors and fault indicators. Switching. Remember I told you how quickly you can get your equipment up or going from one piece of equipment to another? There you go. Use for redundancy. Sometimes you don't get that opportunity, but when you do, you want to use it. 
the idea is normally with servers from what I understand is you don't have just one you have two so that way if one goes down it automatically switch to the other I know that there are some in the Air Force especially with the high priority items that they do have that in place there's always a standby one because if you got to maintain both there is a time where you're going to have to switch it to the alternate one so you can do a PMI on the other one. That's where that switching comes into play. We have something called an auxiliary channel. This, it says, minimizes degradation of the traffic bitstream. That is your aggregate. I've heard of mission bitstream is another one. In other words, that's your traffic that's coming out of the multiplexer. Well, what you don't want to do is you don't want to take up one of their channels. So they devised a way to make an alternate channel to piggyback onto that stream. What does that mean? It means that I have something that no user has. And I can troubleshoot the equipment, too. So that goes back to when you're doing your setups on a tisser and you got problems with the multiplexer. You can actually talk to the distant end in getting an idea where the problem is. Next up we have performance monitors and fault indicators. Performance monitors means what is it doing at that moment in time. Normally it's a meter or some type of gauge. Uh, you guys have used test equipment before that would be a performance monitor. You're going to find out during a PMI, hey, is this within its limits or is it not? If that's not, you know, if it's not within its limits, you got to fix it or send it off the depot. With fault indicators, that's telling you, oh crap, something's gone wrong, i.e., either, you know, something, a bell or a buzzer, a tone, you know, anything that's going to let you know you got a problem. Lights are another thing. Like, for example, the light is supposed to be green and it's red, or the light is supposed to be on and it's off. The easiest way I have found in troubleshooting is I always use my visual first. So, walk in, do I see all the lights on? That's the first thing I'm looking. Do I see any that's, you know, supposed to be this color and it's that color? So that just gives me a nice warm fuzzy as to where I need to go to start my troubleshooting and then I get into what's next and you know mainly your physical how do I troubleshoot this is there anything obvious like a cable's falling off or you know fill in the blank but it's not until you got to get inside the equipment that's where it becomes really a nightmare so we've gone over basic radio picture Radio fundamental radio, I'll get that right in a minute. Fundamental radio parameters, radio performance assessment, and auxiliary functions. Are there any questions? No, sir. No? Mercer, are you there? Yes, sir. Okay, so what are the three steps of PCM? That catch you off guard? Can you hear me? Yeah, I do now. Is that the uh, so, no? It'd be quality, reliability, and speed. Okay, let let me restate the question. For pulse code modulation, what are the three steps to convert analog to digital? Signal. Uh, what do you mean modulation, up conversion, and amplification? Nope. O'Donnell? Now, if you're having problems with your mic, you can go ahead and put it in chat. Is that the sample, quantize, and encode? Bingo! Notice that I went back like a couple of objectives just to see if you were you know you kind of have an idea Prieto what are the four types of synchronization network synchronizations I gotta go back and look at that what are the 
Ah. Well, that kind of screws up things, didn't it? All right, here we go. What are the four types of network synchronization? I was the right path. Prieto? Are you there? I'm here. Okay. Four types of network synchronization. Give up. Yeah, you give me a second. Um, ah, <laughs> looking it up, huh? Anybody? Yeah, I don't know. Rich now? Is that the... Oh. Okay, you, you cut off, Shaper. Is, the, is that the one, uh, the... Mutual, Plesio Cronus, Master Slave, and, um... Uh, I can't remember the last one. Big Ben. Master Clock. Master Clock, uh -huh. yeah. Master Clock. Three a curveball. All right. So let's try three Bravo. You never know when I'm going to ask you a question. So we're going to look at identify basic facts about principles, capabilities, and limitations of modems. This is probably where Jay's expertise lies, right? In, in there somewhere, sir. In, in there somewhere, okay. You can critique the Air Force version of this. <laughs> okay. The idea behind this is we're going to look at modems. We're going to look at general modem principles, type of modulation, forward air correction, interleaving traditional modems and IP-based modems. So let's take a look at this. First of all, the easiest way to describe a modem is taking a digital signal and making it into an AC signal of some sort. The reason why is digital signals, if you hadn't noticed when we went through signaling formats, don't go very far. So when you got to transmit over several miles here to get it to the distant end where the server is or where the network is supposed to be connected, the digital signal is probably not going to make it there. So the idea behind it is getting this modem to create some type of AC signal to send it out to the distant end. AC goes farther than DC. That's one way to look at it. That's the reason why we need to modulate it when we're sending the signal out. Now obviously when the signal comes back into us, we're going to demodulate it. And that's how the idea behind all of this came into play with modems. And it took me a while to try to figure out what the heck is a modem. Well, I grew up with, it came out with the Trash 80s, which is the TRS 80s from Radio Shack. We had the Commodore 64. Then it turned into the 128. Then we had a 286, a 386, and a 486. Woohoo! Now we got color monitors. So you can see the progress now. Ended up with the 56K modem, and then we ended up with this broadband stuff. And voila, now look at us. We're in the fiber optics going pretty doggone fast. Except for me, I'm still wired. We have something called BOD here. This is the speed of the bandwidth per channel known as a symbol. Oh, it's interchangeable between symbol and BOD. Now please understand there's a difference between BOD rate and bit rate. You're going to have a lot more bits than you will BOD. So just to give you an idea, because bit makes up a byte, which is an 8-bit word in some senses. That's standard that we like to see, and then so forth and so on. So when we look at these, we could get as far as 10 bits per symbol. This is probably old technology here. They probably have more because they're trying to develop the 10K TV. So it's probably got a lot more now. 
we have three different types of carriers frequency, amplitude, and phase. First one is frequency. We're going to vary the frequency for ones and zeros. Remember, that's the data. This is also one bit per symbol for frequency shifting. Let's take a look at the diagram. We have for a logic of one, looks like we have a higher frequency. For a logic of zero, we have a lower frequency. Pretty easy to understand in my books. Remember now this is sending it down the line. Looking at that data and the signaling format, I'd probably say this is NRZ. What do you think? And no one responds. Next up, we have amplitude shift king. A little bit different than frequency for ones and zeros. We're going to vary the amplitudes, like the volume control knob on your stereo system or radio. It is also one bit symbol. You can see for a data of one, it's increased its amplitude. For a data of zero, it's a lower amplitude. That's how they differentiate between the ones and the zeros. <clears throat> it still looks like that's an NRZ signal to me. Then we have something called phase shift king. This one, we have several different measurements in it, BPSK, which is binary, and then quadrature, which is QPSK. So binary is, a, is basically a one bit per symbol, and all it's doing is shifting the signal when it goes between ones and zeros. That's how it knows to change the signaling for, or change the format from logic one to a zero and so forth and so on. So let's take a look. BPSK, you can see when it goes from a one to a zero, it shifts. When it goes from a zero to one, it shifts the waveform. These are considered phase changes. Again, one bit per symbol. With quadrature, this one is going to be two bits symbol. This is where we start getting into the multiples. Went from quadrature, went to QAM. My familiarity with uh, QAM is with the ham radio side. They have literally taken this QAM as far as the modulation type and putting it together and sending it out over the airways. What they have found is because of it being so condensed, that the noise does not affect it as much as the other stuff does. So that's the reason why you see somewhat of a move where satellite is not going to be depend on a lot and our backup is going to be more HF. You know, if you get a chance to use SATCOM, you're going to use SATCOM versus HF because they can't, they don't have enough uh, space on the HF dial as opposed to the SATCOM stuff. Now with this in mind, QAM, I know that there's a couple TVs out there that do use this type of style when getting to 4K. You have quadrature, this is that's that quadrature amplitude modulation, that's the three bits. If you take a look at uh, quadrature phase shifting, that's two bits. Now, what does it mean by two bits versus one bit? Well, one bit means you're either going to have a signal of one, the data of one, or you're going to have a data of zero. Those are your choices. With two bits, you literally are going to have two placeholders as opposed to one placeholder for the one bit per symbol. So with two bits, you're going to have like a zero, zero, a zero one, a one zero, and a one one. So that's what it means by two bits. And of course, when you get into qu uh, the QAM, you know, it can go as high as 10 bits. Now, what does this have anything to do with anything? Well, we're getting to that in just a minute, but we got to go through something called forward error correction. 
Now, forward error correction, the way it works is I'm going to send you extra data to the distant end where you're going to play something like Wheel of Fortune, especially if you're on a wired or a twisted pair line, and it's going to put it all together like Wheel of Fortune. And you're going to be able to figure it out. Now, if you were to go on the internet and type in forward error correction, especially in the YouTube world, you're going to find something called Hamming code. H A M M I N G. Hotel Alpha Mike Mike India November Gulf. <laughs> and let me tell you, I understand the professor's name. I understand probably about three to five minutes into his lecture. After that, when he reaches into that calculus pocket, I am totally lost. But it kind of makes sense because they use that error code to put together the signal well enough on the distant end to be able to figure out what that message was. The whole idea behind it is to keep us from retransmitting over and over and over again. The idea is we transmit it enough times to where we start to see that picture being put together. Forward error correction rates, we have a half, three quarters, two thirds, five, six, and seven eighths. What does that mean? It means with, and I'm going to use the first number, it means that I'm going to send two bits of data down the line. One of it is going to be the intelligence, the second one is going to be the correction bit. With three quarters, you're going to send four down the line. Three of it's going to be the intelligence. The fourth one is going to be the correction bit. The idea here is the distant end is going to put it together. So when we look at this, we also have how we, go, how we are going to put this together to get us our baud rate or symbol rate. Three things. First of all, we need to know our data rate. Second, we need to know our modulation type. And third, we need the forward error correction. With that in mind, you can see from this slide, we have the data rate coming in. We have the forward error correction and what we're going to be sending out there. And then, of course, the modulation type. With those three combined, there is a mathematical way of doing it. You will get your symbol rate. We also have another form of forward error correction. We just touch upon it. It's called interleaving. The idea is putting some of that into a packet data, and the interleaving is weaving it in there, so we only lose bits of information versus a whole block of it. That would be a bad thing. We have traditional modem types. Believe me, I, I've heard a lot of these pots and never did understand what AT&T was telling me back in the day. Now I understand it wholeheartedly. Plain old telephones. This is a 56K dial-up modem. I cannot tell you that it was just a couple years ago my mom still had the rotary dial telephone. And everybody's going, what? Yeah, rotary. Look it up. They came in when they put the fiber optics in. They changed the rotary out to what's called frequency fifteen for the phone. Yeah, technology. She leaped from going from a fifty-six K with a rotary phone to having VoIP and the internet at a blazing speed at her house. She's in the middle of nowhere. The Daniel Boone National Forest in Kentucky. Good grief. One disadvantage about that, though, when they switch over to fiber, mm -hmm. uh, my, uh, you, the government still likes having pots to a household. And uh, so it's companies like Comcast, they offer VoIP, but they're not considered a phone company because, because they don't run pots. Because pots will still work even with no power most of the time because it's such a low speed and or analog. Yeah, I think it's 48 volts DC is on that line in order to ring 
the house, but you can pick it up as long as you got a dial tone. Yes, sir. It's a negative, uh, negative thirty to negative forty-eight volts. Yeah, I've been there. zapped with that a couple times trying to do punch blocks in the old days. <laughs> Not a fun thing. Well, I, I think I've had my hands in just about. You know, and this is what you guys can expect too. You know, phones, you know, old stuff with the punch blocks and rotary dials. Uh, you know, you name it, it's out there. And I encourage everybody to, you know, when you see something old, learn about it, man. You you, you just don't know when you might see it again. You'll have a better understanding of how the new stuff works by looking at the old stuff. And uh, the government's. To offer offers subsidies for POTS carriers because the whole 911 thing, like they'll always work. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. All right, next up we have a satellite modem. This one you've already seen. It's called the iDirect. Uh, see if I can pull that picture up. Anybody ever remember seeing the iDirect in the... Uh, Lab room? You can say no. I, be I believe I saw it, but I wasn't sure. Okay. Oh, oh yeah, I saw that. There's a guy that came in and turned it on while we were there. Mm-hmm. See if I can get it to zoom out a little bit more. Oh, look. Can you see the eye direct on it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right in the middle of the page, you can see I direct underneath the, I guess the enclosure there, and then the actual I direct right right below that Charlie Hotel zero three six, which is the idea of that. So it just gives you an idea of what you're looking at. This is a satellite modem. Hope that uh, kind of gives you a better idea. Next up, we have a fiber optic modem. Now, the idea behind fiber optics is it should be any interference from RF or electromagnetic interference is supposedly a PMP pulse. There are five stages, the modulator, transmitter, receiver, filter, and demodulator. I've been hearing with this that AT&T want has stopped their fiber optic just recently. And that's the reason why I'm yelling at them. Because they want to put 5G in, which is supposedly faster, but I got a problem with that. What happens if, you know, everything goes down? We had that happen at Katrina. But anyway, that's another story. But the fiber optic is pretty doggone fast. You have five stages in this case. You got the modulator, transmitter, receiver, filter, and demodulator in that order. Now, with over the airways, it can be affected with anything, i.e. that 5G. Yeah, it's pretty good from what I understand, but we don't have it here yet. They are installing it. I just wish they would continue with the fiber optics. That's my personal. But what am I? We look at IP based modems. You guys probably have this in the dorm. Called Wi Fi? Yes? No? Maybe? Yes. Yep. I would prefer a wired over a Wi Fi any day of the year. Then, of course, we had the iDirect modem, which I just showed you. We have TDMA. You can see we have 30 terminals on the four carriers. What are the four carriers? Oh, wow. Look at that. C band, X band, KU, and KA band. Those are the four carriers, better known as frequencies. Now, with this, the C band all the way up to the KA band is anywhere between, I think it's 2.3 all the way up to 40 gigahertz. That's a pretty high end of the thing. And you're going, okay. You'll notice that the K band is missing. Not K-pop, but K band. 
The reason that they have KU and KA is the letters tell you everything. Well, KU means it's saying under the K band, that's its frequency range. And then there's a KA band, which is above the frequency range. So we're missing the actual K band frequency range in there. And I'm not really 100% certain about the K band because I don't even think the military uses it. I think it's more for commercial. Can you verify that, Airman J? Uh, sorry, sir, I missed that. My sponsor had just texted me. What, what, what band? K band. It's more for commercial than military. Uh, I didn't really deal with our satellite links or our microwave stuff, unfortunately, so I'm not sure. Well, I know the, I know the commercial stuff is like the new microwave stuff is going to be like 60 gigahertz. Shows that the K band is 18 to 27, KA is 26 to 40. That's above it, and 12 to 18 for the KU band. Uh, K band uses. Google's wonderful at times. Ah, K-Ban is one of the two most popular police radar detectors. <laughs> Told you it was commercial. <laughs> okay. The fun stuff, right? And then, of course, we have the summary, which is general modem principles, types of modulation, forward air correction, interleaving traditional modems, and IP-based modems. Remember now, we're looking for basic facts... We try to explain just a little bit more just to get you through it to where, oh, okay, now I understand why. All right, next one up. Restroom, okay. All right, so we're going to look at identify basic facts and principles and capabilities limitations of the line of sight radio system. Any questions on that last objective? Uh, Mr. Maris. Sure. On question number nine, it said X band, and then there's um, two blanks, and it says K band. Mm hmm. What, what is it looking for? Oh, you, you're going to ask that question, huh? Let me look at it. Can you, uh, do you have the capability of, po of copy and paste right now? Yes or no? Maybe? Yes, sir. Okay, copy and paste it down here in the chat, and I'll take a look at it real quick. For those of you who don't know, okay, four frequency bands, I direct modes, X, K, A, K. It's not K band. There should be a blank yeah. next to the K. There's two blanks. That one should be next to the K band, I think. Yeah. So I have the C band, but I didn't know what the other, if one of the two bands, the two K bands, or. Yeah, it's K A and K U band. Now, the easiest way to remember the I direct, now you're not getting the I direct uh, manual because it is extremely difficult. To weed through what you need to know, we just pulled out some information on their specs page. That's the reason why it's short. The way to remember these bands is think of it as, let's say, one of your popular bands, but the way they pronounce it would be the X or the CX and the KUKA band. Get it? KUKA, Q for K under and is above? No? Maybe? Did I, did I help you out with that there, Mercer? 
I guess I'm just because there's two blanks. So like in the K band, the K U and the K A would be covered in the K band, right? Uh, a K band's its own separate entity. Let me. Uh, hang on. Let, let me look for it real quick, okay? I gotta. I gotta find your. Appraisal or study guide workbook? Study guide workbook, page 47. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah, I think that K band's a typo. Should be K blank, you know, K blank dash band, and then the other one. So you're naming all four. Yeah, that's what I was confused about. Yeah. It's fine. Thank you for pointing that out to me, because I don't even think our... Smee knows about that one. Let me see what he's got for his answers. Yes, I'm going to save it. Which, of course, will be into a other. Yeah, that band is supposed to be a K-U. Okay, thank you, sir. That help? Does everybody understand that? On number nine, under Objective 3 Bravo, must be a typo. It is K-U, Kilo Uniform Band. He's missing the uniform portion. I was wondering about number nine. I couldn't quite figure it out, so I just put them all. <laughs> oh, well, that's one way to do it, too. They, I think what he did is he, you know, according to my master copy, I don't think he put the U on that KU band on your copy. So you, you are correct. If you put all four, that would be the way to go on it. Save this. And we'll get right back to this. Does everybody understand? Anybody not understand? All right, so we're going to be looking to identify basic facts, principles, capabilities, limitations of line of sight radio systems. Just remember, uh, you got to get 28 of these correct. Apparently, yesterday somebody missed 14 of those, which you don't get to pass. And then we had one individual. One I heard score 70, but everybody else was in the high 80s and low 90s. And as we well know, we are going to be looking at line of sight communications. And I just now noticed that for some reason, all of these are the same, but yet they show up differently on OBS. Ah, yes, line of sight. This is different than what you have learned in block four when we talk line of sight. Line of sight meaning 
well, gee, when I put up a vertically polarized omnidirectional antenna, I have line of sight. Well, that's true. We're going to be dealing with a different line of sight where it's very directional. In other words, we're going to be pointed. It's one way, one way only. So if we can't get the receive or transmit function to work from uh, to the distant end, we got some issues here. So the way we look at this is we're going to look at line of sight principles, repeaters, limitations of repeaters. Now, with the repeaters and line of sight repeaters, these areas are on your C's and D's. That's your electronic C's and D's. So when you look at line of sight principles, the idea is we're going to be using a dish in order to receive one as well as transmit one. There is, on the left-hand side, those are called Mickey Mouse ears. Uh, I got the, I guess, the fortunate pleasure of going to Fort Gordon and seeing what the Army was doing at the same time going through some of the SATCOM stuff up there. No, I'm not SATCOM. I'm old ground radio, but when I came in, they were separating SATCOM away from ground radio, but they still had it out there in our shops so I got to learn a little bit about it but not in great detail because they were leaving this is one I think this is on page one and on the C's and D's underneath underneath of where you see true earth status let me get it out. Underneath, you will see these devices right here. And that's key in some of your homework questions. You'll see that Earth radio horizon extends 15% farther than optical. And again, that's on those C's and D's, page one. And then when we look at the comparison of radio horizon versus true horizon, there is a 33% difference. You can see that we have true horizon here. Go a little bit further, that's how far we can see versus the radio horizon. And it has everything to do with how well it's electrically coupled to the Earth, i.e., the ground waves. It also has everything to do with the frequency, too. Next up, this is the typical idea behind line of sight principles when we're dealing with microwave and SATCOM range 20 to 50 miles frequencies 3 to 50 gig and powers 1 to 5 watts we're going to look for why do we use line of sight radios well first of all if you're getting on a base it's bare bones system you're going to take those testers out and you don't want to be digging cables, so in order to, for you to get from one side of the base to the other, you're going to use these line of sight, using the multiplexers with them, and being able to connect your users to the other side of the base. Or, in some instances, you may need to get to what's called a listening post or observation post. So they may have it but they are in an area where mm, it's kind of hostile so by using this you can bypass some of the problems that if you had cables it's not going to get blown up the other reason is, is because of the terrain and distance for example you don't want to be trying to drag cables up and over a mountaintop when this would work especially if you're going to set it up as a repeater to extend the radio horizon that's when repeaters come into play we have two different types of repeaters that, uh, not two different types, we have four different types of repeaters that we're going to go through, but there are two things that they must, must do. The first one's called frequency translation. In other words, I'm going to take the frequency I receive 
and then I'm going to change it into a different one so I don't interfere with my receive side of the house. So when I retransmit, it's going to be a different frequency. The other thing too is when I receive the frequency, it's going to be pretty weak. So I have to amplify it and send it out to the distant end. Doesn't make any sense not to do those two. This is the four repeaters we go over, but we only have pictures of the RF and the IF repeater. The baseband and the audio we do not have pictures of, and, and there's reasons. So let's take a look at the first two. First of all, the RF repeater. Again, Let me see, this is page two. You'll see that there will be two different repeaters. The top one is your RF repeater and what we're going over. The next one is the IF repeater. Below it, page two of the electronic C's and D's. So the RF repeater, we want to receive four 400 megahertz. We're going to take it, we're going to amplify. There's our first satisfying of the RF repeater analogy. We're going to take that amplification, we're going to combine it with the local oscillator, and we're going to bring that frequency up to a level of 4660 megahertz, and then amplify it and send it out. So there we have the frequency conversion and amplification. So we amplified it before we mixed it, and then we amplify it to an operating frequency, whatever the wattage is going to be. The reason why we do those two is to keep from interfering between the receive and transmit frequency. Change that frequency conversion. This is the largest amount of distortion or noise that you're going to introduce into a system. But when you go to the IF repeater, it's less noise. And why is that? Well, because you break the signal down even further, you're able to clean it up more. In other words, there's going to be more filters and so forth and so on. So our idea behind it is the same frequency conversion and amplification. But we're going to break it down to the IF frequency and then gradually bring it up. This is, again, this is the easiest way of getting more noise out compared to the RF. We get to the baseband one. This one is basically what the repeater, or, or excuse me, the tisser does. It is a baseband repeater. You can put two repeaters you know, facing opposite of each other and connect it up with the appropriate cable and therefore you have that particular repeater. It is better than the IF one. Why? Because you're breaking it down into an aggregate signal now, not an IF signal. So you've broke it down even further, you've cleaned it up better to where you've got that particular signal and then you can do whatever you need to do for example if you need if you just happen to be that site where the repeater is you can actually put signals in and take signals out so you may be just a hub there and then retransmit it out to the other end with the audio repeater, this one we break it down into the original signal. And the reason why they say audio is that is about as clear as you can get it. It's not to be confused with if you need to get a computer or whatever, but VoIP is another way of looking at it. With an audio repeater, it is the most expensive, but it's the best. So money talks and everything else walks. Again, this is the best repeater. Here are the limitations of repeaters. We have distance, so in other words, how far we need to do it. Can the equipment get far enough out there as far as distance? So you gotta look at what the equipment can do versus how far you need to cover. Is it over rocky terrain? Is it just 
you know, flat, flat earth, so to speak, <laughs> confined stuff, is rolling hills, what do you need it to do, is all based off of terrain. And the needs of the communication network. For example, if you got an outpost and they want to play, let's say, Xbox Online, obviously that's really not a need and you're not going to run multi-million dollar equipment up there. But if you're doing observation, you have a lot of cameras up there being able to look around and seeing what goes on, and you have an outpost to a listening post, so to speak, then that's a need of the network because, you know, back at the base, they're looking at that going, okay, we got some enemy coming our way, so we need to prepare for it and assist with the LPO piece. So that would be a need of the network. Playing Xbox isn't a need. It's a nice thing to have. Because I dealt with stuff at this, mainly radios at Hill Air Force Base, a lot of the people would come in and say, I want this. Well, that's great. We agree with you. Yeah, you could use it. Well, why aren't you going to get it for us? Well, we're not the ones who provide that money. You do. Oh, well, I guess never mind. <coughs> I guess the needs of the network wasn't that needy afterwards. Normally it was like something that they wanted to do to help them out better with the job. But the squadron wouldn't pay for it. Well, that's part of the problem. So we got noise factor in here, frequency versus time. Frequency being that uh you know, the first repeater, time being that baseband repeater. So the difference is, is you can only do eight repeater links versus 15 or TDM. So we've gone through line of sight principles, repeaters, limitations of repeaters. Are there any questions? A lot of information, isn't it? Yes, yes sir. And hopefully, we'll get through this one, and we are done for the day. We have approximately 20 slides where you guys can fit well. Doggone, wrong page. There we go. <clears throat> Identify basic facts about tropo theory. We're going to be looking at tropo in general terms. You're going to deal with this when you get out there with a tisser and if you get to a new, you know, one of your new bases there and they have what's called the P2P 600 or 700, this also applies to it. Looks like the Air Force is going to this P2P 600, 700, depending on what model you get. Why? Because it definitely outperforms the pisser as far as what it can provide for multiplexing. Oh my goodness, this is like huge. And you're going, well, why aren't we replacing the tisser? Well, we are. We just got the new two P2, P2Ps in, but we have to develop the class to do so. And on top of that, not all the Air Force has P2Ps. And there's a couple squadrons that still have the tissers in place. So even though we are upgrading ours, uh, we still teach the old stuff because you might see it, and it does translate to the new stuff. Just to give you an idea, the tisser max distance on it can go 25 miles, less than 25 miles. The P2P, 125. That is ridiculous. Ridiculous when you compare it to pissers. We're going to look at tropospheric communications, antenna terms, tropospheric antennas. Let's get right to it. So, what is tropo? Well, obviously, it is one of those systems that's going to use a troposphere. Now, it says beyond line of sight communications method. I have a problem with the way that's stated. Yeah, you're going to see some of the manuals say beyond line of sight. I like to call it over the horizon. Let me explain. 
First of all, it differentiates between microwave versus HF, big time. The max that you're going to go with Tropo is about 600 miles. And you need a lot of output wattage, I think 50,000 watts. I mean, we still use it in the military. Most of those are tactical. They're only going to go max wattage at 300. And one of the reasons why I say over the horizon is, yeah, you can do that for stateside, but if you're in a wartime situation, you just became a huge target even at 300 watts. So I call it over the horizon because of its limitations. This is as far as it's going to go, 600 miles, maybe 610, depending on what website you go to. With HF, thousands. <clears throat> In some instances, it's not rare, it's just unusual. You can actually hear yourself around the world. I've, I've heard of it, been in there where we were able to do that twice since I've been here. So it's, it's very unusual, not rare, it happens. But most of the time you can get several thousand miles out of HF versus, and, and it's called beyond line of sight. To me that's more appropriate and then when we look at tropo it should be over the horizon. <coughs> it is a new term that NASA and NOAA are coming out with. <clears throat> Not quite utilized a lot but it is being utilized. The idea here is when we use tropo we are refracting, not reflecting, another one of those mis mistypos in the study guide workbook as well as the slides. It refracts back down to earth, not reflects. It does not go according to what reflection is saying. Why? Because of tropo, there's a convergence zone in there and it bends in that conversion zone. So the idea is I'm going to saturate the tropo to where I can get it to where some of it is going to get refracted back down to earth. So there you have it right there, refracted energy. The area that it normally does it is in the convergence zone and that's the convergence zone being the in-between layer between the stratosphere and the troposphere. Mostly it's in the lower part of the troposphere convergence zone. We look at the power for this, it's 300 to 50,000 watts. We got frequency of 350 megahertz to 8 gigahertz. And again, it says 595. I don't know where they pulled this out of, but if you read any credible website, you will see anywhere between 580 to 610. You can get more, but it's a rarity, and it has to do with ducting. In the tactical sense, maybe 150 miles. Scatter volume is where that area is, where it gets refracted back down to the earth. The idea is I'm going to saturate it like crazy and get that refraction, but it's going to be dependent on how well the gain of the receiving antenna does. We have a diversity system for it. We have polarization, angle, space, and frequency. Now, with this one, polarization, when we look at transmitting and receiving, because this is a full duplex system you're dealing with, it doesn't make any sense for you to be transmitting the same polarization as a distant end, does it? You're just going to saturate it thinking, well, I'm going to receive it. Well, no, that's not the way it works. Because the other end is, is transmitting at the same thing, maybe a different frequency, and it's going to interfere. So what happens is, is one end is transmitting at one polarization, let's just say it's vertical, and the distant end is transmitting horizontally. So there's no interference between frequencies. That's one thing. Now, when you get into the lab and you 
get the tisser together. Now you can see right above me there's a picture of a tisser on a tripod. When you look behind the dish and the waveguide on the RF assembly, you will notice that you can put the waveguide either horizontally or vertically polarization for that particular frequency that you're going to enter in. The distant end is going to be different. So whatever your polarization is, the distant end is not going to be transmitting on that polarization. When you take a look at where you got to plug your waveguide in, it's at a 45 degree angle. Now I think there's one tisser in there that has the little plexiglass that goes over that. It's off. If you were to take a look in the back there, you will notice that the antenna is probably about, I would probably say about an eighth, maybe a sixteenth of an inch long. And it's at an angle. It's at a 45 degree angle. The waveguide dictates the polarization in transmit. When it receives the 45 degree angle, doesn't matter. Why? Because let's take a look at the Nivis. The Nivis has all of its antennas at 45 degrees. So at the bottom end, you have omnidirectional, vertically polarized, and when you get to the top end of that antenna, you start to see horizontally polarized. So when it's receiving, it doesn't care. It's only when it transmits. So we covered polarization as well as frequency when we look at the differences of your transmit frequency and receive frequency. They will be 200 megahertz apart. So that's where that comes into play. So polarization and frequency do have a play when you're doing the tisser. With angle and space is if I don't have the angle correct, I'm not going to receive it. Or if I have the angle correct, I'm not going to get it to the distant end. Also, the space between your two units, the farther apart, the more problematic it's going to be with your angle. So that plays into it. So all of this has to work hand in hand in order for you to be able to make the communication happen. You're not going to see it with the tisser because you are so close together. You're probably 50, maybe 100 feet apart. So if you're in the hallway, you can actually point the dish in the opposite direction and still make communication. That's how close you are. If you're outside, maybe a couple miles apart, that's where you'll start to see some issues. All right, common volume and scatter volume are the same not to be confused with the scatter angle. You can see that they imply that we have reflection, but it's not. It's when you get to that conversion zone and it's refraction. We have two terms here we're dealing with. You guys have seen reciprocity. It means that my antenna is going to do both well in transmit and receive. For directivity and gain, it has everything to do with how well you direct it. If you got very much a huge amount of directivity, you're going to have higher gain. If you have a lower amount of directivity, you're going to have low gain. Let me try to explain that. With a vertically polarized, omnidirectional whip antenna, is not going to have near the amount of gain as what a parabolic dish will get. So the more directivity you have, the higher the gain. We have frequency, and this has everything to do with your electrical length. The higher the frequency, the smaller that wavelength is going to be, which equates to how small your antenna can be. The lower the frequency, the bigger the antenna. Not to be confused with the dish. Dish actually gives you better gain. So you could have, you know, a huge disk at, let's just say, 8 gigahertz. You got a lot of gain with that antenna. The antenna that you will actually see is probably very small, about that small. As opposed to if you put that antenna on, let's say, an HF, then the disk is even going to be huger because the antenna is going to be huge. 
That's the reason why they don't use HF for SATCOM. So we look at the type of antenna as far as our directivity. The idea here is I want most of my energy to go straight out where it needs to go and not have anything you know, differentiate like an, a vertical whip would. We have two different types. You got a horn parabolic. The horn, pretty obvious. We went over that in block four. You can see it has a flare aperture and it does some impedance matching. The parabolic, we look at the, when it says size and gain, that's what I was just explaining to you about. The bigger the dish, the better the gain. It does use a feed horn. You have two different types called front feed and rear feed. On the parabolic is mostly a front feed. There are two different types. We have a center and off that offset. And then, of course, we have rear feed. We have a Cassegrainian and a Cutler. On the Tisser is a Cutler. We'll show you a couple antennas here to give you an idea what you're dealing with. So with the first one, we have a front feed, which is considered center fed. This one's an offset. You probably went right by them where that gated in area is. I think there's one or two out there that is similar to that. You also have something called a Cassegrainian. This is a rear feed, in other words, the antenna is on the back side versus the antenna being on the front side. And what that means is it has to bounce twice, once off the dish and once off of the parabolic subreflector. You'll notice the differences between the parabolic versus this one, which is a cutler. Okay, parabolic. In order for you to do the double shot, it's basically a rounded section. With this one, it has two metal reflectors, and underneath each one of those metal reflectors is a rectangle hole. This is considered the narrowest and the highest gain. Most of our antennas for the Tisser with the small one, it's a small waveguide, you should be able to see that. Just take the opportunity, look at it, and look underneath those two metal tabs there, and you'll see it. You'll see the, the two holes there. So we've gone over tropospheric communication, antenna terms, tropospheric antennas. Questions? A lot of information, I know. No questions? All right. Go ahead. I was wondering, sir. Yeah. Um, do you have your general or extra? For ham radio? Yes, sir. I don't have either. I just dwell into it. I have a CB radio that I play with on occasion, and the upper end of it does get onto the ham radio side. It's a very old radio. We're talking 70s. Oh, okay. I was just wondering. I, because I, uh, I have a technician's. Okay, but I know what you're talking about. Uh, the best book I've ever seen on that thing is the A R R L book. Probably the best out there. Yes, sir. They just came out with new ones because they uh, changed how they license people now. Oh, great. Well, around here, I, I have looked. And I think the closest place that we can get a ham radio, uh, a ham radio operator's license or a technician's license is out of Atlanta. So that's the closest. We used to be able to have it in Mobile. There was a place in Jackson that you could go to for it. Me and another person were going to look at getting our licenses. And after that, negative. We're still looking. We're, we're, we're hopeful. All right, if that's it for the day, we'll see you at 1 o'clock. And at this point, any last questions? No, maybe? Again, type it in there, send me a message, and we'll see you at 1 o'clock. All right? Yes, sir. Okay.